Greetings, fellow detectives. Wizard Kitten here, bringing you a new Nancy Drew analysis video. Today's video is brought to you by the patrons over at Mystique Manor and by all the official fellow detective channel members. If you too would like to support the channel and gain access to exclusive features, check out patreon.com slash wizardkitten to become a patron, or click join next to the subscribe button to become an official fellow detective. One of the fascinating things about being a fan of the Nancy Drew series is that we have 33 games to play and discuss, which makes ranking them all the more entertaining. One of the even more fascinating things, in my opinion, is noticing trends across players even though we all have wildly varying tastes. There are some games, for example, that are pretty widely beloved and very rarely fall into someone's bottom five. And then there are games that often fall into the bottom five of rankings, or at the very least are unlikely to be included in a top five. Which brings me to today's game, Trail of the Twister, a game that usually ranks pretty low for a good swath of detectives. Trail of the Twister used to be in my bottom five for the longest time, but I've since had it switch places on my official ranking with Labyrinth of Lies, which means it is my sixth lowest ranking game, number 28 out of 33. This is really a shame because there are so many glimmers of hope in Trail of the Twister, so many little details that could have resulted in a much better game if some of the issues were just thought through more. So on that note, how can we fix Trail of the Twister? What would I change to make it one of the best games in the series? Let's discuss. And yes, there will be plot and culprit spoilers for the game in this video. You have been warned. In my opinion, there are two glaring issues with Trail of the Twister and a handful of more minor concerns. The first major issue is that Trail of the Twister is perhaps the most tedious game in the entire Nancy Drew series. I have nothing against a puzzle-heavy game, but I do have significant issues with games that do not successfully balance puzzles with the story, rely on puzzles to pad out game time, and do not provide sufficient reason for puzzles to be completed. Puzzles are fantastic, but they need to have a point, especially if they're difficult. Because if I end up spending a long time on a puzzle and pulling my hair out, there better be a good reason for it that supports the world building and results in some sort of important clue or outcome. This is where Trail of the Twister goes terribly wrong. Many fellow detectives, myself included, not so fondly point out that this game might as well be a chore simulator. Puzzles like the tornado siren chart or fixing the car motor are long, difficult, and have absolutely no consequence beyond moving the game forward. Other puzzles, like the mousetrap puzzle, are painfully repetitive because they need to be completed more than once and the end result only brings us to a location. The actual solving of the mousetrap does nothing important, so it feels like a waste of time. Other time wasters with no definable purpose include the corn light puzzle, the prairie dog puzzle, organizing Debbie's files, fixing the antenna, and organizing the candy display. The problem is that there are so many unnecessary puzzles that they stop being fun. Eventually, you start to wonder why you're doing all this work in the first place, just to progress in time in the game. This is the first major issue that needs to be remedied. Trail of the Twister can be a puzzle-heavy game as long as the puzzles have defined purposes and are not literal chores. The second glaring issue with Trail of the Twister is that it manages to feel low stakes, mundane, and even boring despite the fact that it's about tornadoes. Tornadoes are a terrifying natural disaster, capable of wreaking unimaginable havoc in a matter of seconds, but you really wouldn't know it playing this game. The danger of tornadoes is alluded to, and occasionally we see tornadoes far off in the distance. Nancy is outside in the rain once, but never once does she have to contend with flying debris, dangerous winds, or up-close and personal tornadoes. The one time she does have an opportunity to do so, she's in a storm cellar where we as the detectives cannot see anything. Then, when we're supposed to be driving around in peak storm conditions, we are thrust into a third-person bird's-eye view, which completely removes any personal connection to the storm. 
Effectively, this game removes from tornadoes their danger and intrigue, and somehow makes them boring. This was a mistake. So we have puzzle chore syndrome and boring tornadoes, but Trail of the Twister also goes wrong in several other respects. First, it somehow manages to make every single character forgettable. This could be due to the fact that Trail of the Twister has one of the larger casts in the series with five physical characters in total, so the time dedicated to each character was spread too thin. However, we've seen other games with five characters with much more personality and development, like Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon or Warnings at Waverly Academy, so we can't really rely on that as an excuse. The problem really came down to how these characters were written and the roles that they played in the case. As we've already discussed, Trail of the Twister is basically just a chore simulator. So what purpose do the characters serve? Not much beyond presenting us with more chores. This means that their personalities can essentially be diluted down into chore provider with specific job and one personality trait. Debbie is the manager chore provider who is responsible. Scott is the boss chore provider who is angry. Frosty is the photographer chore provider who is arrogant. They don't have interesting backstories or even deep personalities, rather superficial personality traits with a chore veneer. The only character who is interesting in the game is Pa, who actually shows some vulnerability and has a definable personality, but he's sequestered away at Ma and Pa's convenience store, which makes it easy to forget that he's in the game at all sometimes. Long story short, the characters were really boring, and the manufactured drama between them wasn't complete or believable enough to make them memorable. Another issue is that the emotional core of this game gets buried in the mundanity of the plot. There is actually a really interesting angle to explore with Scott Varnell, an angry, bitter professor with an ego complex who thinks that his work has never been appreciated and that everyone else is to blame for his misfortunes in life. There's also the tragic loss of Ma, Pa's wife, during a tornado where the sirens didn't go off, which makes Scott feel partially responsible. Given the depth of this emotional storyline, sabotage of his own team just doesn't seem drastic enough, therefore the stakes of the game don't feel that high. There was this super interesting thread to explore, but the game never really seems to pick it up. In my opinion, in order for Scott's motivation to work, the emotional stakes of the game need to be higher, and his crimes need to be more significant. Sabotaging his team for money feels kind of like a lazy crime, and actually doesn't get Scott any of the recognition or power that he thinks he deserves. Basically, his motive doesn't match the crime, which is a huge problem in a mystery. In order to make his motive work, the game needs to be darker and more mature, dealing with real-life topics like greed, resentment, vanity, and jealousy head-on. And finally, Trail of the Twister is really limited in its exploration, which makes the environment seem lackluster and inconsequential. Nancy doesn't really find clues in this mystery, or at least not many of them. Most of the objects that she interacts with are puzzles or chores, and again, most of these do not result in finding a clue. Trail of the Twister takes place in Oklahoma, a Great Plains state of the U.S. This region of the United States is not known for being visually spectacular or interesting, which is a shame because there is actually a lot of beauty to be found in the plains. Unfortunately, this game seems to unintentionally reinforce that this is a boring location, because there is nothing but static images, bird's eye views, and non-interactable rooms to see. There was a huge missed opportunity to explore which not only adds time and interaction to a game, but also makes it feel more personal and meaningful. So, now we've covered the main issues that I have with Trail of the Twister. The music is great and doesn't need to change, several puzzles can remain the same, and the locations can work well with some tweaking. But what would this all look like? It's time to settle in, grab a refreshing beverage, and kick back as I describe to you my version of Trail of the Twister, one that I think is vastly improved.
Nancy has been hired by Krollmeister to do due diligence for his company. As part of his business, Krollmeister extends grants, university funding, and technology and equipment to scholarly pursuits that he finds interesting. The recipient of his most recent grant was the Canute College Storm Chasing Team. But Krollmeister suspects that something is amiss. The data the team is reporting all seems legitimate, but there have been dozens of accidents on the team and even one fatal accident of a local resident. Krollmeister wants to ensure that his funding is being used appropriately. So he hires Nancy as an undercover due diligence investigator. Nancy arrives on the first day. It is cloudy and rainy and there's lightning and thunder, but no tornadoes just yet. She heads into the Canute farmhouse and finds a note for her posted to the door. Everyone on the team is out responding to a potential tornado development, so Nancy should sit tight, get settled, have a look around, and most importantly, stay safe. Nancy pokes around the office, living spaces, and basement of the farmhouse. When she has looked at all the required items, the storm outside starts to get louder. Nancy goes to the window and suddenly sees a tornado roaring in the distance. It looks like it's headed straight for the farmhouse. If she goes outside or stays upstairs, Nancy will be hit by flying debris and will get a second chance. If she goes into the basement like she's supposed to, the power will flicker out and she'll be down in the basement in the dark as the storm rages on. At one point, she hears broken glass. When the storm seems to subside, Nancy heads upstairs and finds that a piece of flying debris broke the window in the dining room. Nancy must clean up the glass with a quick puzzle. Once she's finished, Scott Farnell and Debbie Kirkham enter the house. Scott's character is exactly how he is presented in the original Trail of the Twister. Debbie Kirkham is younger, a graduate student in her early 20s working on her dissertation with Scott as her dissertation advisor. Debbie rushes over and greets Nancy, welcoming her to the Canute farmhouse and asking if she is okay. Scott huffs and walks into his office, completely ignoring Nancy. Debbie apologizes, explaining that Scott is annoyed that they were in the wrong location for the tornado that formed. They realize too late that their path predictions were several miles off, and it looks like the tornado narrowly missed the farmhouse. Nancy shows Debbie the broken glass. Debbie sits at her spot at the dining room table and starts to explain to Nancy that everything seems to be going wrong for their team. An undergrad researcher was seriously injured just a week ago, and they just seem to have terrible luck. Everything always seems narrowly amiss. Debbie asks Nancy if she would be willing to patch up the window while she writes up a damage report. Nancy agrees and does a puzzle where she has to find pieces of wood, a hammer, and nails around the Canute farmhouse. She then patches the window with another puzzle. When she's done, Debbie notes that it is late and the team is turning in for the night. She suggests that Nancy head to bed as well. The next morning, Debbie greets Nancy and informs her that, as the newest resident of the Canute farmhouse, it's her turn to make breakfast for the team. Nancy heads to the kitchen and completes a simple cooking puzzle similar to White Wolf of Icicle Creek, where she makes fried eggs, pancakes, and coffee and orange juice for each member of the team. After breakfast, Debbie gives Nancy a list of things that Krollmeister requested she check into for her due diligence project. This includes things like interviewing all members of the team, checking the tornado siren maps for accuracy, checking on the damaged car and Krollmeister GPS that the undergrad research assistant was using when he got hurt, checking on the field sensors and antenna, and examining the field equipment used on the team's storm-chasing truck. Since she has to go to Ma and Pa's convenience store and garage anyway, Debbie also gives Nancy a shopping list to replenish the team's disaster kit in the basement. Nancy gets to work. She completes the tornado siren puzzle to verify its accuracy and interviews Debbie and Scott about the team's operations. Debbie seems eager to help, maybe a little too eager, but earnestly seems to believe that the team is just experiencing bad luck. She hopes it ends soon though, because as a dissertation student, she needs the team to uncover solid data in order for her dissertation to be approved. Scott behaves much like he does in the original, short-tempered, gruff, rude, and condescending, but he doesn't seem to be hiding anything. He thinks Nancy being there is a waste of time and explains that storm chasing is a dangerous business. If Krollmeister wanted to invest in it, then he should have considered that. Nancy then clicks on her car to go to Ma and Pa's convenience store. Rather than driving in a third-person view, clicking on the car simply transports Nancy right to the store. There is also a garage attached to the side of the convenience store. Nancy meets Pa and they have their usual opening conversation. 
Pa also relays information from Chase Relaford, the mechanic who owns and runs the garage attached to his store. He shows Nancy the damage report and gives her the broken GPS. Nancy is able to call Chase and talk about the damage, but he is no longer a physical character. Sorry Chase, it just wasn't necessary. Nancy buys what she needs for the disaster kit and can explore Pa's museum. She then heads back to the Canute farmhouse. Nancy puts away the items for the disaster kit and then heads to the backyard of the Canute land. Since we've saved development time and energy from the map and the surrounding locations, we can include a fully interactable prairie landscape that Nancy can explore. Imagine stepping through a fence and finding a series of winding prairie trails, similar to how Nancy can explore the woods in Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake, but they're prairie. By making her way through the trails, Nancy can find stopping off points with beautiful views of prairie grasses, wildflowers, scattered trees, and clouds. The occasional prairie dog, butterfly, and prairie chicken cross her path. Eventually, at the end of the labyrinthine trails, Nancy makes it to a storm-chasing van parked on the very edge of the Canute property. Here she finds Frosty Harlow, a meteorology graduate student earning his degree purely so he can become a famous weather personality. Frosty is constantly messing with cameras and video cameras. He is sociable, vain, and excitable. Also working at the van is Brooke Tavanaugh. Like Scott, Brooke is another full-time faculty member at Canute College in the meteorology department. She's friendly and stubborn, sarcastic and witty. She prefers field research and also admits that she prefers doing any kind of work that gets her out of Scott's vicinity. Despite having to work together often, the two don't see eye to eye, something that Brooke makes abundantly clear. Nancy interviews both Brooke and Frosty about the data, the accidents, and Krollmeister's tech. Brooke gets defensive when Nancy questions her data and insists that her work is valid. She doesn't want Nancy there, but she'll be civil as long as Nancy doesn't get in her way. Frosty gives Nancy one of Krollmeister's cameras to test. He gives her a list of things to take pictures of that will test all the different modes of the camera, including certain animals around the property, certain wildflowers, and particular cloud formations. Brooke shows a radar scanner in the van and asks Nancy to test it as part of her due diligence work. Nancy completes the puzzle, similar to any one of the other storm-chasing truck puzzles, and heads back to the Canute farmhouse as the sun sets. The next day, it looks cloudy and a bit purplish outside. Nancy talks to Debbie and Scott, who gives her a map of all the sensor and antenna locations out on the field trails. He tells Nancy that his data says that a tornado could form after noon, so it would be best to do this work before then so she can get back to the house safely. Nancy can choose to go talk to Pa, Frosty, and Brooke if she desires. She can also fix the GPS at this time and see the coordinates that were programmed into it before it was broken by hail. Nancy heads outside to the prairie trails. She takes all the required pictures for Frosty, finds all the sensors based on the map from Scott, and runs tests on them, each one a mini puzzle, and finds the two antennas based on the map from Scott, one of which needs to be repaired. All the equipment seems to be working properly, so Nancy turns to head back to the farmhouse. The whole time she's been out, the wind has been steadily growing, and the sky has been turning steadily darker. At the end of her tasks, it's now raining, and to her horror, Nancy realizes that a tornado is headed her way. She needs to find her way out of the prairie maze in time. If she takes too long, she'll be hit by flying debris and get a second chance. If she makes it back in time, Nancy will shelter in the basement with Scott and Debbie. While down there, Nancy yells at Scott for telling her the tornado wouldn't arrive until afternoon. Scott is immediately angry and yells at Nancy that he said the tornado would be coming before noon. It's not his fault that Nancy didn't listen. Debbie dissolves the fight, the storm passes, and Scott stomps up the stairs, slamming his office door. Debbie apologizes, then, trying to change the topic, encourages Nancy to look through their data files to compare her findings from the sensors and see if she can find any discrepancies. Nancy goes to the filing cabinet in the basement and examines the files. She compares her data from the sensors and the antenna from the previous week to the reported data in the files, and it all checks out. It's starting to seem like maybe the team really is just experiencing bad luck. Then, in the back of the filing cabinet, Nancy finds a file of news stories. 
Within, she finds out that the local resident who died as a result of the tornado sirens failing to sound was none other than Ma. Nancy can interview everyone about this information and also starts asking about the undergrad research assistant who got injured. Debbie is apologetic and evasive. Scott is angry and petulant, immediately throwing Nancy out of his office. Brooke is sad and says she blames herself. She made a call for the sirens to be initiated, but they were faulty and didn't trigger in time. Frosty is sad, but honestly can't stop talking about the media coverage and what a big deal it was for journalism. When she asks Pa about it, he's incredibly evasive. He admits that Ma is gone, but tells Nancy that he can't bring himself to talk about it. The sun sets and the third day begins. On this day, Nancy needs to finish up all chores and due diligence that she hasn't yet completed. At this point, all of Nancy's data seems to suggest that the team really is just experiencing bad luck. All the equipment appears functional, all the numbers match those being reported from the previous week, and even if some members of the team are dysfunctional, they still seem to be uncovering results. Nancy says as much to Debbie, who seems nervous for some reason. She suggests that Nancy may want to check the team's website. She's been working on it herself and wants Nancy to report to Krollmeister about the efficacy of the website in communicating their findings to the general public. Nancy agrees and checks out the website on the laptop. As she flips through the pages of the website, Nancy realizes that something is strange about each web page, almost as though there is a clue hidden on each one. When she investigates further, a written code pops up on screen that she has to decipher. Ultimately, the message reads, false data, sabotage. Now this is exciting. Nancy heads upstairs and gets Debbie to admit in hushed tones that she put a secret message on the website and that she was the one who anonymously reported concerns to Krollmeister. When Nancy asks why Debbie didn't come forward sooner, she explains that her entire graduation and dissertation acceptance are dependent on the data and results from this summer's research. She can't risk insulting Scott or presenting falsified data to her dissertation committee, but every time she ran her own data, it was different from all of the data being officially reported before Nancy showed up. When Nancy asks who could be behind it, Debbie says she doesn't know. Frosty is known for exaggerating data and information to better his stories, and all the numbers are inflated, suggesting bigger and badder tornadoes, so it could be him. She has a hard time believing that either Scott or Brooke could be behind it because, as scholars, their entire careers hang on the validity of their work. Time for some sleuthing. Nancy has to find a way to get all the suspects away from their posts. She distracts Frosty by telling him that a journalist showed up at the Canute farmhouse asking for him. While Brooke is busy, she hacks into his computer and finds selfies of Frosty smiling in front of terrible storm damage and making short, dramatic videos on private property. Kind of shady, but not necessarily illegal. Nancy then distracts Brooke by telling her that Debbie had some questions for her. Brooke says it's time for lunch anyway, so she locks the van door and heads back to the house. Nancy picks the lock and finds files of temperature, dew point, and wind speed data along with several projecting graphs with theories about tornado formations. She doesn't understand them, but grabs them anyway. Back at the farmhouse, Nancy distracts Scott by telling him that Brooke found some urgent data out at the van and needed his opinion. Scott leaves his office, locking the door behind him. Nancy gets the key from Debbie and snoops through Scott's office. In his desk, she finds a file just like Brooke's, but the numbers are different. Nancy brings the two files to Debbie, and they compare the numbers to her independent tests. Debbie and Brooke's match, but Scott's are all inflated. In the file, they find letters where Scott writes that he has discovered a guaranteed formula to predict tornadoes based on the confluence of wind speed, dew point, and temperature. Copies of the letters were sent to multiple outlets, many of whom responded with book deals, grant approvals, and offers for paid patents to develop technology to predict tornadoes once and for all. Except his data isn't accurate. Scott has been falsifying his data to make it look like he has managed to successfully predict tornadoes. He has been lying about the gravity of his findings, which in reality showed no significant relationship. Furthermore, he's been lying about predicting tornadoes after the fact, saying that he knew the correct formulas for tornadoes after they happened. If anyone called out his mistakes, he lied. 
Scott gave false GPS coordinates to the undergrad research assistant, and he intercepted Brooks' call to have the tornado sirens turned on when Ma died because he couldn't make his formula work to predict a tornado at that time. To try and get Nancy out of the way, he told her the wrong time that a tornado was going to form. At every turn, Scott tried to make himself look like a god of the meteorology world, someone who could predict tornadoes with certainty. He created a fake formula and then used it to get credit that he felt he deserved. He was just moments away from becoming rich and famous, all because of false data. Nancy says as much when Scott walks in and overhears her. By now, it is nighttime and the skies are growing dark outside. Scott slams the front door and locks it behind him. He demands that Nancy tell him what she thinks she's found. Nancy confronts him and Scott scoffs. It's his word against hers. If Debbie tries to interfere, he'll kill her dissertation and Debbie will lose all the progress she's made towards getting her degree. But, he says, he has no leverage over Nancy, so it's time for her to go. Good thing a tornado is about to form, he says. He can feel it. The power goes out just as Scott lunges for Nancy. Everything goes black and Nancy wakes up, tied to a tree out on the prairie. The wind blowing and raging, debris flying everywhere, rain pouring down. She has to find a way to escape, but she's not safe yet. She has to get inside quickly enough or the tornado will gust her up and she'll get a second chance. When she manages to make it to the Canute farmhouse, the door is locked. Nancy has to break a window to get inside, again, very quickly. She rushes downstairs to find Debbie, Scott, Brooke, and Frosty. Scott looks appalled. There's no way Nancy should have escaped. But she did, and he can't retaliate with everyone there. He's trapped, and once the storm is over, Nancy reports him to the authorities. Within this version, Scott's greed and arrogance are at the core of the story. There should be other false flags for all the other characters sprinkled throughout, but I believe that this version of the main plot makes better use of the space and resources, maximizes the characters and their drama, and gives everyone stakes in the plot, making the motive line up with the severity of the crime. It balances the puzzles, raises the stakes, makes everything feel more real and dangerous, and allows for significantly more exploration. But that's just my thinking. What do you think, fellow detectives? What do you think of my version of Trail of the Twister? Do you think it would improve the game? What other changes would you make to the game, and what would you keep the same? Let a wizard kitten know in the comment section down below. If you really enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button or tipping me for the video with a super thanks next to the download button right beneath the video. If you would like to come join a fantastic group of fellow detectives at Mystique Manor as a patron for the channel, gain access to exclusive content, and support the making of more content like this, please check out patreon.com slash wizardkitten. I also have channel memberships with exclusive badges and emojis to use during streams and in the comment section. If you'd like to support the channel by becoming an official fellow detective, click join next to the subscribe button. Please feel free to follow the channel on Instagram or Discord linked in the description box down below. And as always, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more Nancy Drew and Cozy Game content. Thank you so much for watching, fellow detectives. I will see you soon.